Hello and welcome to this webcast on Geographic Calculator. I'm Taya Youngs, an application specialist for Blue Marble Geographics, and I'm here with Sam Knight, the Director of Product Management. Hello and welcome everyone to this session. Uh, today's session is going to be a little bit of a special session. We're doing part one of a two-part series on linking together Geographic Calculator and its geodetics engine to Global Mapper. Uh, so bringing the power of the Geographic Calculator's conversion abilities uh, along with the high-powered mapping and analysis functions found in Global Mapper. So this session is going to be geared towards uh, the beginner to intermediate level user just getting to know uh, the calculator, uh, probably more from the Global Mapper side. And uh, we're going to be looking mostly at the calculator. Um, so we're going to be featuring uh, the data source menus uh, that we'll be uh, looking at in the next session to uh, bring over to Global Mapper. Uh, we're going to be looking at the options menus where we configure some of the basic uh, workspace uh, preference settings and some of the administration tools uh, for streamlining some of those menus. We're going to get into the GeoCalc dialogues themselves, uh, which is where we make things like coordinate system selections, datum transformations, and so on. And we're going to look at some applications of those on the interactive conversions job. Uh, we're going to use those as some basic examples to step through exactly how GeoCalc works uh, before we move over into the next session, uh, which will be posted sometime next week. Uh, for those of you watching uh, as soon as this is up, uh, that will be hosted by my colleague David McKittrick, and that will feature the global mapper side uh, of the operation. You can subscribe to these videos from our webinars page at www.bluemarblegeo.com or from our YouTube channel page. Additionally, you can find out about training opportunities at our training site. Both web addresses are shown on screen. So why would I want to link the two applications? All right, well, so both the Geographic Calculator and Global Mapper are very good at what they do in their respective uh, areas. So Global Mapper's got a very, very strong set of analysis and mapping uh, tools for all the sort of general purpose GIS work. Um, it does a lot of you know, very specialized things, and it does have a, a number of coordinate systems available to it. Um, that said, it has uh, a collection of really around a few hundred coordinate systems available to it, uh, probably somewhere around 100 horizontal datums as well. Um, but right now it doesn't have any vertical datum support, uh, so it's not possible to uh, do things like geoid transformations uh, from one system uh, to another. Uh, working with customized coordinate systems is possible, um, but it's not the strength of the application. And that's where Geographic Calculator comes in. So the Geographic Calculator uh, has access off the shelf uh, to 5,000 coordinate systems. It's somewhere more than 5,000 coordinate systems at this point. Uh, there's over 500 horizontal datums, um, but where these two applications are really going to start to get some strength is in the addition of vertical datums and vertical datum transformations. So Geographic Calculator is going to be able to enable geoid-based uh, transformations to things like LiDAR data, uh, uh, digital elevation models, uh, depth models, uh, any, any type of 3D data. Uh, we can now perform a vertical datum transformation uh, on uh, data in Global Mapper. Um, that database of parameters with all those 5,000 coordinate systems in uh, the calculator is searchable. Um, so it's, it's very uh, uh, much more efficient to navigate through that, that large database of coordinate systems and parameters. And uh, the simplicity of managing the two applications together. Uh, you have a single database uh, that is a comprehensive database. It's based on the EPSG database uh, with all those thousands of coordinate systems. Uh, you share a single database between both applications. So there's no need to add custom systems to Global Mapper and then also to Geographic Calculator if you have both of those. They simply share uh, one database right out of the box and uh, it simplifies the management of that. Uh, in GeoCalc, today we're going to be taking a look at all of the, the nuts and bolts of how we navigate through those systems, uh, various things that we're going to be able to set to streamline some of those choices uh, that we have, 
Uh, we're going to take a look at some administrative tools uh, that folks can use to lock down certain uh, sections of the, the database uh, to help uh, restrict folks from using things they shouldn't be using, as well as uh, streamline it to guide folks to the coordinate systems or transformations that they are intended to be using uh, across an enterprise or in a small work group or, or even just for a, a personal user. Um, and lastly, we're going to be taking a look at how there's just generally more exposed information about all of the parameters, all of the coordinate systems that are used under the hood. Um, so there's uh, there's absolutely nothing that is hidden uh, in any of the, the parameters. All of these are fully searchable, verifiable, and when possible, we've actually even cross-referenced these out into other databases. So to get started, uh, for those users who are not familiar with the Geographic Calculator, we're going to take just a very brief look around at the basic infrastructure of the application. Then we're going to climb into the menus where we actually get at all of those, those coordinate system parameters and the admin tools uh, that we're going to be focused on here today. So for the Geographic Calculator, the version we're looking at is Geographic Calculator 2015 Service Pack 1 and we're looking at the 64-bit version of the application. Uh, there is both a 32 and a 64-bit uh, flavor of the application. Uh, all of the tools we're going to be looking at today are found in both of those. Uh, there are no differences uh, between the 32 and 64 in relation to the, the database handling. And we're going to start off just by taking a look at the interface. So over here on the left-hand side of the screen, we have our project manager. And this is uh, what I have here in our, our list of just those five jobs there. This is just our jumping off point. This is a fresh, uh, out-of-the-box installation of Geographic Calculator. So those five jobs are different types of data conversions that the calculator can do. Uh, the interactive conversion that we have selected is shown here on the main panel uh, on the right-hand side. So this is our, our conversion job for single point-to-point -point conversions. And for those of you coming over from Global Mapper, uh, you'll notice the, the view is fairly similar uh, in terms of the, the coordinate conversion layout. Uh, the left-hand side by default is our input. The right-hand side by default is our output. And we simply define whichever coordinate system we want for input and output uh, in the blue boxes on the lower half of the interface. Now these blue boxes access the GeoCalc dialogs that we're going to be taking a look at. And they, these are going to be standard dialogues that we see over in Global Mapper once we've made the link uh, between the two applications. So all of the other types of uh, interface that we have in the project manager here, these are other specific uh, job types for things like point database conversions, uh, numeric data coming from things like Excel sheets or ASCII tables, seismic survey formats where we can load things like uh, the OGP P111 formats, uh, the older SEG formats, UCOA, and so on. Vector data conversions uh, for things like uh, shape files, tab files, AutoCAD, LIDAR, uh, and so on. And raster transformations where we handle uh, all of your, your basic imagery types and some of the digital elevation model types as well. Uh, today we're mostly just going to take a look at the interactive conversions uh, to give us a, a sense of the, the coordinate uh, uh, handling and the coordinate system dialogues that we're going to use a little more in depth uh, next week over in uh, the Global Mapper side. So to focus on the, the areas we're going to be taking a look at here, we have our options menu that I mentioned earlier. The options menu is where we're going to be taking a look at some of the basic application preferences and administrative settings. And the data source menu is where we actually get into all of the definitions found in uh, the database of geodetic parameters. So this is going to list all of our things like uh, coordinate systems, uh, transformations, simple things like linear units, uh, vertical datums, and all of the other nuts and bolts that make a, a geodetic parameter database. Okay, so here on the interactive conversions job, we're going to start a little simple workflow by setting up a conversion that's going to require uh, two different coordinate systems and a transformation to get in between those two. Uh, looking at this example, we'll then step through uh, the data source menus to see exactly how that gets uh, set up for us because there's a lot of things that happen behind the scenes and these are the same types of things we're going to be bringing up in our global mapper session. So first, I'm going to punch in some simple coordinates. Uh, I'm going to enter in a latitude of 44 degrees north and a longitude of 70 degrees west. 
And I'm just going to use a, a very nice simple number here to drop us down uh, somewhere nearby where we actually are here in Maine. Um, and we're going to say that these coordinates are relative to WGS84, uh, just for simplicity. Uh, WGS84 is our default uh, coordinate system. That one comes up when you first fire up the application. And that, of course, can be changed to something uh, more locally applicable to your part of the world uh, as one of the preferences we'll take a look at. On the right hand side of the screen, I'm going to call up our GeoCalc dialogs to select my output coordinate system. And so for this example, I'm going to set that output system to the North American datum of 1927, our older common uh, survey uh, system that was used here in uh, all across North America uh, up until the, uh, the mid 1980s. Uh, so to activate that in calculator, I'm going to double click on the blue box labeled system and it's going to prompt me for a, a simple choice here. Do I want to do this based on a geographic area, which will present me with a graphical map, uh, or do I just want to skip that and go right into the database? Uh, for this example, I'm going to skip that and I'm going to go right into the database so we can get at the dialogues that we'll actually be seeing over in the global mapper set. So because I already had a coordinate system set in there of WGS84, it's going to call up uh, the, the particular system and the particular folder that that system is found in. So in this case, WGS84 is going to be already selected for us, and it's going to put me into the world folder found under the geodetic category of coordinate systems. So in here, you're going to notice that there's a few different categories. These top level categories we have are fitted coordinate systems, which are localized engineering grids, and those are a specialized uh, coordinate system that are actually created inside the geographic calculator from control data. We have geocentric coordinate systems, uh, which have a few other names. Those are also known as Earth-centered, Earth-fixed, uh, or simply 3D Cartesian coordinates uh, as well. Uh, geodetic is all of our common latitude-longitude based systems. Projected a little farther down there, are those are all of our projections, things like transverse Mercator, Lambert conformal conic, stereographic, and, and so on, about 90 different projections, and string-based coordinates. And string-based coordinates are a very specialized uh, group of, of systems uh, where there is a, a format that's applied to a position. Uh, it usually lives on top of a projection of some sort, but the coordinates themselves are formatted into alphanumeric uh, grid schemes. Uh, some of you may be familiar with things like US National Grid uh, or the World GeoRef System, uh, or uh, for those of you in the British Isles, uh, British National Grid. Uh, coordinate systems like that, where we have a combination of individual zone areas that are assigned a letter and then smaller local offsets uh, to get down to uh, the, the granular final position. Uh, so those exist in a few pockets all over the world. Those are our top level categories. And now for those of you that are going to be hooking this up over on the global mapper side, what we're going to see over in global mapper are the geodetic category and the projected category. Uh, string based coordinates don't really make a whole lot of sense in the context of uh, most vector based uh, maps. Uh, since you're not actually dealing with exposed coordinates, uh, we're dealing with uh, data types that don't have any room for those string-based coordinates. Um, so the string category will not be there over in Global Mapper. As well, geocentric coordinates uh, are only uh, limitedly uh, used over on the Global Mapper side. Uh, for the most part, uh, most of the, the systems that we use over in Global Mapper are either latitude-longitude, so geodetic systems, uh, or projected systems are by far the most common. Uh, the fitted engineering systems as well, uh, those are uh, set up for transformation here in calculator only and so those are also not going to be seen over on the global mapper side. Um, so in the next session we'll be seeing just the use of the geodetic and the projected subcategories here uh, in these dialogues. Within each of those you'll see that there is a further level of organization. Uh, so this is geopolitical usually. Uh, most of these, the top uh, or the, the second level of organization rather, is based on continent. Uh, and then beneath each of the continental areas, we'll see smaller political subunits. So mostly those are going to be uh, country borders. And sometimes there are simply geographic uh, groups of uh, sometimes several countries together uh, that uh, make a commonly used uh, regional area. Uh, all of these areas as well are searchable. So let's say, for example, we're looking for uh, NAD27 uh, for our output system. Uh, if I know exactly where that is, I could 
click down under North America and find NAD27 at that level. Uh, or if I thought maybe it was only in the United States, I could click into there and see if it was there. Um, if you have absolutely no idea exactly what, what subregion that should be found in, you can select a folder and then search within that using the text search at the bottom of the interface. So I've just selected geodetic and I'm going to enter in a simple text uh, entry of NAD27. And over on the right, you'll see some different categories uh, that we can search in. And these categories are going to change depending on what type of parameter you're searching, whether in this case it's a geodetic coordinate system or whether it's something like a projected system, or if you're in different categories like datums or linear units, angular units, there's going to be different attributes that you can search in there. Now the default on these is to search all uh, of the fields and uh, this is mainly just for quick entry. You can search in here by uh, text or EPSG code uh, or some other name that might be contained in the definition and it will search through all of those bits. So I'm just going to do a simple text search for NAD27 and fire off that search and we'll see I've actually got a few different versions of NAD27 uh, that we might use. And this is where uh, the, the power of GeoCalc really comes into the mix. Uh, we'll see that they have uh, different areas of use defined for them. We have a column here called area of use that says uh, one of these is used all across North America. And then we have two other regional uh, sub uh, versions of this uh, that are different realizations found for the areas of Ontario, Canada and Quebec, Canada. Uh, we have EPSG codes uh, assigned and visible to those. You'll also see that these have different dimensions. So one of these is a three-dimensional system and two of these are intended for two-dimensional uh, use. Further to that, we can actually open the parameters of any of these systems. So I can right-click on uh, any of those definitions and say View Info. And that will uh, expose all of the parameters that make this definition a thing. So inside a geodetic coordinate system, we have an area of use defined uh, on the definition tab. Uh, area of use tells us exactly where on the planet this coordinate system is used. We have a point style, which is uh, basically a fancy version of units. Uh, it includes uh, the base unit that the coordinate system uses, but it also has some information about the coordinate axes uh, that will be used in that system and then also the datum. And so a, a geodetic system is a, a fairly simple object to uh, define. Uh, things like projections, you're gonna see a lot more parameters uh, down at the bottom of the interface here. Um, if I wanna know more about any of these pieces of the definition, I can simply click the info buttons uh, on the right of whatever the entry happens to be. So if I wanna see the parameters of the horizontal datum in this lat long system, I'll just click info next to the datum and that will open up another uh, viewer containing all of those parameters. I can get into the definition of that, see the ellipsoid, and I could actually open up the ellipsoid parameters if I wanted to. Uh, prime meridian, same thing. And uh, as well, we've also got two more tabs that appear on all of these dialogues. So we have identification information. This usually has the name of the system and then any remarks uh, or comments uh, about its definition. Uh, frequently the remarks will be populated from the EPSG database uh, entries. And then at the bottom, we have identifiers. And I mentioned earlier uh, that some of these are cross-referenced and that's what the identifiers are. Uh, the, the issuer codes that you see uh, assigned are particular uh, authorities. Uh, these represent other databases. So things like uh, the CS map uh, conversion library, that's an open source library, uh, the EPSG database itself, uh, ER mapper codes uh, for that particular projection engine, uh, the OGP uh, universal reference, uh, and that is a special link right into the, uh, the OGP's EPSG web registry, and uh, ESRI PRJ code uh, names uh, that match those up against PRJ files. Uh, these are going to vary depending on the definition, uh, and depending on how many uh, databases that particular definition is found in, uh, but those are a good way to match up uh, definitions between different applications that you might be trying to work with. And then lastly, on the history, this is going to be populated for any uh, parameter that comes from the EPSG database. So this has a history of the definition uh, of that uh, datum or system or whatever the, the parameters happen to be. Uh, it has uh, 
basically uh, change information about how those parameters have been uh, represented in the EPSG database. And this sometimes provides some very useful information when uh, trying to research uh, some older parameters, uh, particularly things like uh, transformations uh, or uh, projections that have been in use for certain regions for a long time and may have had some changes to them over the years. So with those uh, three different tabs, those are going to be our standard uh, information source for any of the, the parameters. Uh, through the use of those, there is no parameter that is left uh, hidden. You can fully expose uh, just about everything in there that is a parameter-based system. Uh, if it's a, a grid file based uh, system or transformation, uh, the names of those files and the paths to them will be uh, fully exposed. If it's a system based on mathematical parameters, those will all be fully exposed in there as well. So I'm pretty confident. I just found the NAD27 that I'm looking for in there. So all I need to do is double click that to bring it back to our main interface. So now I've defined my input system, WGS84. I've defined my output system of NAD27 and I'm ready to actually select my coordinate transformation in the center. To make that selection, all we need to do is double click the coordinate transformation box that sits in between the two coordinate systems. This is going to call up uh, a dialog that looks fairly similar uh, to the dialog we were just in for selecting the systems themselves, but you'll notice it has a little extra piece. It's got a viewer on the bottom and it has uh, some different categories. So over on the left, we have the subcategories of types of uh, geodetic transformations uh, that we can make. Uh, and in this case, we'll see we have two categories. We have data source transformations. Those are things that are uh, predefined combinations of coordinate systems, uh, or uh, excuse me, predefined combinations of transformations. And we have generated transformations, which are uh, things that we figure out. So the calculator will make uh, different connections that are not just predefined, and these will be two-step connections to get from our source system uh, to our target system. And so we'll see different methods here highlighted. So we have a, a couple that are uh, going from one NADCON transformation to another NADCON transformation, and one that is a group of geocentric translations uh, into a NADCON transformations. So through the, the use of the generated transformations, we have a, a very, very high degree of flexibility for things that we can figure out uh, for ways to connect uh, coordinate systems um, from the source to the, the destination. I typically look at these uh, by just simply using the all category and applying various uh, sort options to these. So you'll see uh, in the, the transformation map at the bottom, as we select any of these transformations, it will zoom to the area and highlight a polygon around the area where that particular transformation is intended to be used. Uh, we see all of the, the various names of those transformations, and so we'll see things like NAD27 to WGS84, and then in parentheses we'll see 51, and you'll see a different number in parentheses for a lot of these. That parenthetical uh, is simply a part of the name that comes from the EPSG database. Um, so in, in the EPSG database, what this is telling us is there are many, many different ways because one of these is actually 79. So there are a lot of different ways to get between NAD27 and WGS84. So why do those all exist? Uh, that is simply because these are for different areas. The specific areas these transformations all apply to uh, are shown under the area of use column. Now, area of use is something that exists in the database of Geographic Calculator, uh, but there's no concept like this in the uh, off-the-shelf uh, database from Global Mapper. So this is one of the places where we're going to be able to use some additional tools to help us make good choices over in Global Mapper. So what we have here are a collection of common uh, transformations. Uh, you'll see we have the first three that are uh, defined for individual areas there. So we have uh, the first one is uh, specific to uh, USA and Maine. Uh, we have one that covers New England. Uh, we have one that covers the entire continental uh, US. And then at the bottom, we have a next group of three. And these are those generated transformations from the, the other category. And so those are showing us two transformations linked together to get from uh, WGS84 to NAD27. 
So in this case, these are going to go from WGS84, stopping on NAT83 in the middle, and then from NAT83 to NAT27. Um, you'll notice the names, uh, for those of you who are, are new to the application, you'll notice that the names don't appear to go in order. In this case, they go NAT83 to WGS84 and NAD27 to NAD83. Uh, all of these definitions go to and from a particular definition, and they can either be uh, done in the forward direction or in the reverse direction to connect all the dots. So the name doesn't actually change uh, for that particular transformation, but they will be done in the appropriate order to connect all of the dots from uh, the source system all the way down to the target system. So then when it comes to actually making a choice for these, uh, we've got the information based on the working area uh, for where that transformation is said to be applicable and accurate. And we also have uh, some tools that guide us on the accuracy itself. So the accuracy column in here, uh, you'll see, uh, has uh, sometimes two accuracies listed and sometimes one accuracy listed. And that will come from uh, definitions where we either have two transformations taking place or just a single transformation taking place, uh, such as this uh, number 79 down here. Uh, so most of these uh, are actually going to be linking together two transformations. And we can take a look at those. In the same way we looked at the coordinate system parameters, we can simply right click on those and say View Transformation. And it will bring up a definition dialog for us that allows us to see exactly what's being connected in here. So this is a horizontal transformation. Uh, it's telling us that it's a concatenated transformation. And that means that this is a predefined transformation from the EPSG that connects two individual transformations. And then it will list them down at the bottom. So in this case, it's going from NAD27 to NAD83, and then NAD83 to WGS84. So it's going to connect those dots for us. And each of those transformations has its own accuracy. And the accuracy is listed uh, as uh, usually a fraction uh, of meters or increments of whole meters. Uh, so in this case, our first uh, transformation is said to be accurate to 15 centimeters. And our second transformation is accurate to one meter. Uh, so for those of you that are, are new to accuracy in general, what that means uh, is basically the level of confidence that your position uh, after its transformation uh, is going to be exactly where we say it is. Um, so the first transformation uh, has a uh, level of accuracy of maintaining about 15 centimeters of accuracy. Uh, and then the second one uh, maintains one meter of accuracy. So uh, overall, uh, from our input coordinate to our output coordinate for this particular piece of data, uh, the, the accuracy overall is going to be the combination of those two. So this would be accurate to about uh, 1.15 uh, 1 meters. Um, and that's pretty solid. Uh, every time we, we do a transformation, there is uh, accuracy dilution uh, as we're uh, going from system to system. That is simply endemic to uh, coordinate transformation, regardless of uh, what, what tool it's actually being done through. Uh, transformation does introduce a little bit of accuracy loss. And so it's very important to keep track of what is actually happening to the coordinate data as it comes and goes from various coordinate systems. Uh, single transformations can be viewed in exactly the same way. Uh, so we right click on those, say View Transformation. And in this case, for a single transformation, it just goes right to the parameters of that particular transformation. So it tells us the method. Uh, in this case, it's the NADCON grid method. And it will also list off the particular grid tables that are used for this transformation. Um, so these, these files can be found right on uh, the local installation uh, for that. And there are a number of transformations that do require grid files to be used. Uh, both horizontal and particularly vertical transformations that we'll get to in a little bit. So for this particular uh, combination here, I have an, a number of uh, methods that are, are fairly similar, we'll see in terms of our accuracy. Um, so because my point is here in main, I'm going to go ahead and grab that first one. So I'm just simply going to double click on it. And that returns us back to the main interface. So from here, we can actually go ahead and finish off our calculation. So I'll just say calculate down at the bottom, and we'll see our output coordinates come out on the right hand side of the screen. So the analog of this in Global Mapper that we'll be taking a look at in our next session is either in uh, importing data and exporting it out as a different projection or different coordinate system, uh, doing batch processing uh, for file conversions, 
uh, in the in the uh, the batch process tools over there, uh, or just simply in loading data and combining uh, data from different sources uh, in different uh, coordinate systems and projections into the the final map uh, or the analysis of the data that we'll be producing. So we can also add on uh, vertical transformations here. And so this is uh, gonna be kind of a, a key function uh, for those of you working with uh, 3D data in Global Mapper, uh, anything from LiDAR data to uh, digital elevation models, uh, depth maps, uh, any, anything like that. So on the vertical portion of the coordinate system, you'll see there's an extra field at the bottom labeled vertical. So this is a vertical coordinate system that we're going to be selecting over here. We select these exactly the same way as the horizontal. We double click on the box and up comes a menu of all of the vertical coordinate systems handled around the world. So here I'll simply select a basic ellipsoid height model and I'll return that back to our interface. And on our output side, I'll select uh, a local vertical datum that we use here in the States. I'm gonna select uh, the North American vertical datum of 1988. Um, now all the same tools exist around the edges of these. We can open these up to look at any parameters that are used to define them. Uh, and we're going to have the same uh, tools available uh, for selecting the transformations. So with the addition of our uh, vertical systems here, you'll notice the coordinate transformation blanks out in the center. And that's because we've been changing the, the settings on the input and the output uh, for our, our systems. Uh, but with the addition of the vertical uh, systems, we're also going to now have extra fields for entering in different values. Um, so on the, the input side here, I'm just going to say let's uh, work with a uh, one meter ellipsoid height uh, for our input coordinate, and we'll select that uh, for our output coordinates as uh, uh, or our, rather our output system is going to come out with that uh, in the NavD88 uh, equivalent on the right hand side. So we select the transformation exactly the same way. Uh, we just simply double click in the middle and up comes a list of first our horizontal transformations and again I'm just going to pick that first transformation from the the last step and then it's going to move on to our vertical transformations and you'll see here out of the box we have a few different ways to connect uh, those uh, those transformations and first off they all look red and that is because these depend on additional grid files so we have uh, an, a number of different geoids that are used here uh, for these combinations uh, in, in the States. And uh, they, they are simply revisions that go through the different years. And so that's what, why all of these have a different year tag along with them. Uh, so our most current is the, the US geoid model of 2012B. And because all of these are red, uh, it indicates to us that we don't have a necessary grid file to let us uh, use these definitions. So if we open these up, we can view the transformations uh, that, that need to go on. Um, and it tells us about the files uh, that, are, that it's looking for uh, in the installation and not finding in this case. Uh, we can download any of these right from this interface. And this will also be possible uh, from the Global Mapper side, as we'll see next week. I'm going to right click on that particular geoid model. And I'm going to say download missing files. So when I do that, it's going to go out to our website and download the relevant grid files to enable that particular geoid transformation. So just like on a cooking show, I'm going to skip ahead here and I'm now uh, pulling the cake out of the oven as it were, and I've already downloaded uh, both the US geoid models uh, 2012A and 2012B. So on screen, you'll now see those reflected with black text, uh, no exclamation point, uh, indicating that they are missing their grid files. So I can then simply select either one of those by double clicking on it, and that returns me back to my main screen, and I can then finish off my calculation. So that will read out both the horizontal and the vertical uh, transformation of that coordinate. So this overall concept is exactly what we're gonna be seeing in Global Mapper after we've enabled GeoCalc mode. Can I make my own vertical datums or use custom parameters? Yeah, so under the uh, data source menu, uh, we have access to all of the different types of definitions uh, that can be used within the calculator uh, or also brought over into Global Mapper. So to set up something like a coordinate system, we would go down under the coordinate system definitions panel. 
And in here we would see all of the different categories of coordinate systems uh, from lat long to projected to our vertical systems. And uh, if we wanted to say, for example, make a vertical system, we'd come down under vertical. You'll see there's a little plus button down there. Uh, we would click that to add a new vertical coordinate system, give it a name, any identifying information that you wish, put in any required parameters, and then that a definition would be a part of the database from then on. Likewise, under the data source menu, there's all of the other types of parameters that can be found. So everything as simple as a linear unit uh, or a uh, new horizontal datum, up to the coordinate systems and transformations, which are really the most complicated uh, definitions in here uh, to define. If you have the parameters, it's possible to add just about anything in here. So a vertical transformation, if we were going to be setting up a new geoid-based transformation, you'll see a number of these uh, have uh, grid files missing, similar to the, uh, the, the NavD88 uh, combination we looked at earlier. Um, those could either be defined uh, as a, a custom transformation, or you can simply download the ones that we have uh, available for those on our website. Uh, a lot of users are getting into customized uh, uh, vertical datums for uh, LiDAR projects in, in remote areas uh, or places where the local vertical systems uh, just aren't accurate enough to, to work with, with uh, modern high accuracy, things like LiDAR data or high accuracy terrain models. So to create a, a vertical uh, transformation to a custom system, first you'd start off by creating the vertical coordinate system itself, and then you'd come into the vertical transformations, uh, find whichever category uh, it fits into, or your own uh, local folder, if you wanna create a, a special folder for your own uh, custom systems in here. And then you'd simply uh, click the addition button to add in a new vertical transformation uh, definition. Um, there is a method uh, built in here uh, that allows the use of a custom uh, vertical grid. Um, this is a, a new feature uh, that we've just added uh, this year uh, to the geographic calculator and that is called a blue marble vertical transform grid. Uh, that grid is actually created over in Global Mapper. So it will start with some uh, local offset data. Uh, if you have gridded offset data defining a uh, vertical geoid surface, uh, you can grid that in Global Mapper and come back over to the calculator, plug it right in here as a vertical transformation, and then apply that, uh, that custom geoid both in Geographic Calculator and in Global Mapper as well. Is there anything I need to configure in, in Calculator to make it available with Global Mapper? No, the Geographic Calculator and Global Mapper just simply need to be put on the same machine. So as long as they're both installed, uh, it can be either 32-bit or 64-bit, as long as they're both installed on the same machine and you have a compatible version of the Geographic Calculator and Global Mapper, uh, they will communicate with each other. Uh, it's a one-touch uh, configuration that we'll see over on the Global Mapper side in the, the next session. What about Global Energy Mapper? Okay, so Global Energy Mapper is a, a name that we used to use for a subset of features within Global Mapper. Uh, we had some special font packs and some special terrain analysis features that have since been merged into the regular version of Global Mapper. So if you are uh, currently a, a Global Energy Mapper user, um, basically you've got a version that's a couple versions back and there, there was a geographic calculator that would line right up with that. Um, but uh, as we've gotten into the last couple versions in 15 and 16, uh, Global Energy Mapper is simply one and the same as regular Global Mapper. So all those functions have been put right into the main application uh, and the, the geographic calculator uh, mode is simply one of those functions that's been merged in. Is there a special license to use these two packages together and what does it cost? Uh, there's no special license uh, required to link the two up other than simply having a license for both Calculator and Global Mapper. Um, so there's no extra extension or anything like that that needs to be enabled. It's just simply installing the Calculator and installing Global Mapper and then telling Global Mapper that you would like to use GeoCalc mode in there. Is there a performance penalty to running GeoCalc mode in Global Mapper? Okay, so uh, performance hits usually come in when you start seeing things like third-party libraries getting used uh, in an extension on an application. Uh, the interface that we use in uh, Geographic Calculator to bring that into Global Mapper 
doesn't exactly behave the same way as extensions function in a lot of applications. Since we control both sides of the, the code, the, the code that comes from Geographic Calculator and the code that comes from Global Mapper, we're able to put this in tandem with each other and essentially eliminate any type of performance uh, hit that might come. Uh, there are some things that, that you'll notice, uh, particularly for users that are doing uh, large uh, scripted batch processes where you're timing uh, intervals and things like that. Uh, those users might notice uh, a little extra time required to do some processing, uh, specifically where you're doing things like vertical datum transformations. And the reason for that is this is something that wasn't actually possible before in Global Mapper. So you are actually going to be doing more work in some of these cases. But for all of our normal cases, just like a horizontal transformation or a coordinate reprojection, you won't actually notice any type of a, a performance penalty uh, when running geocalc mode uh, in Global Mapper. The next piece we're going to take a look at is exactly how all of the surrounding tools uh, affect coordinate transformations and selections of coordinate systems and other parameters from the geodetic parameter database. So when we make our selections of the horizontal and vertical systems uh, and the transformations that we've just done on screen, there's a lot that goes on that actually streamlines that interface. And uh, admin level users can actually apply this uh, to both help and restrict choices that uh, users on your team have available to you in either Geographic Calculator or over in Global Mapper. So we're going to take a look at some of those administrative tools that help us set up the streamlining. We'll see what happens out of the box, and we'll also see what can be custom configured. First to do that, we're going to go up under the Options menu, and we'll hop into the Administrative Settings. Now the Admin Settings is made up of uh, four tabs on this dialog. Uh, each of the tabs uh, covers a particular piece of the administrative type settings. So on the general tab, there are various locks that can be put in place. Now these uh, actually lock down things like file locations, uh, where certain files are able to be stored, uh, what workspace the user is taking advantage of, uh, and simple administrative things such as that. Under the geodetic tab, this is where we actually make some geodetics choices. Uh, do we want to see the uh, via intermediate category, for example, uh, under generated transformations? Uh, do we want to override things like uh, interpolation of grid files and things like that, or allowing null coordinate transformations? Under filtering is where a lot of users actually do some work. Um, the, the geodetic tab is tends to be a little bit higher level stuff. Uh, the filtering tab is where a lot of folks do some streamlining of the application. So this allows us to eliminate certain categories of things, such as projections uh, that you don't want to be available to your end users, uh, particular transformation types that you want to hide from the end user, and vertical transformations that you want to hide from the end user. Um, so on the main part of the filtering panel, uh, you'll see uh, the various methods. And so these are whole projection categories, not specific coordinate systems, but the whole projection types themselves, horizontal transformations, and again, those are methods rather than individual transformations, and the vertical transformations, uh, also uh, whole method types rather than any particular geoidal grid. Where folks do a lot of the work on this is under set data source view and filters. Under this dialog, uh, we see uh, a master version of the overall coordinate uh, parameter database. You see all of the types of objects that are found in that database. And we can filter down under things like coordinate systems and take a look at all of the, the coordinate systems that we find in the database. Uh, there is a checkbox that is added to this. And the checkbox is simply whether or not that particular object is visible to the end user. Uh, with the, if the object is checked off, it is visible. If it is unchecked, it is invisible to the end user. And when it is invisible to the end user, that simply means that they will not see that coordinate system or that horizontal datum or that linear unit, whatever the object is that you've chosen to hide in your interface. Now, some users will use that, uh, or admin users rather, will use that to uh, place restrictions uh, to keep users out of trouble. Uh, if you have folks that are inclined to uh, make a poor decision about what should be used in an area, and other users will use that to simply reduce the number of choices and make things a little 
little bit easier to find. Um, so to do a, a simple example on this, I'm just going to hide uh, some of our angular units. So under angle units, I'm going to click on all and we'll see that we have about a dozen different angular units. And these are things that we typically use inside uh, the geographic calculator. Um, so for example, I have only ever commonly work with degrees. I almost never use uh, grads or radians or any of the other uh, smaller angle units like, um, like micro radians. So in my own desktop installation, I very commonly uh, shut off everything and then only turn on uh, degrees. And uh, with those, those two filters put in place, when I save that and go back to my, my main interface, we'll see that on the uh, conversion settings, when I go to select uh, a type of unit to use for my latitudes and longitudes, I only have just the degrees. I don't see the other uh, the ten extra system or ten extra angular units that we would have uh, in place normally in this dialog. So that type of filtering applies to all of the different object types. So under the data source menu, you'll see all of the things from linear units to datums to coordinate systems. All of those things can be hidden either individually or entire folders or categories of things can also be hidden. Those view settings will show up over in Global Mapper. So uh, the database gets uh, set and streamlined uh, in the geographic calculator by the admin or the, the single user if you're doing this for yourself. And then all of those same settings will show up over in Global Mapper when we actually turn on geocalc mode. The other type of filters uh, that we're going to take a look at in the admin settings are under the area of use menu. And this is a very powerful tool. Um, so there are, are two levels of filtering that take place. Um, as we entered in the original coordinate on our interactive conversion, you saw it only actually listed off for us uh, some particular transformations. Uh, so I mentioned that there were many, many ways to connect the dots between those two systems, but we only actually saw about six of them. Um, so what happens to all the rest of those other possibilities for transformation? Under the area of use category in here, you'll see a section uh, about data source areas of use and custom areas of use. So these are different filters that can be applied to your data, and these are spatial filters. They read where your data is in the world when you load your input file, uh, or in the case of Global Mapper, when you load the data into your map, and they apply different filters for what is possible for transformation based on those systems. So we have the two that I mentioned, we have the data source areas of use, and those are the, the areas of use that you see, uh, the, the ones with words uh, describing where a particular area is. If we follow those through to their, uh, to their definition, you'll see that the definition is a bounding box, uh, and there's a polygon attached to that bounding box as well. So there are complex areas defining all of the coordinate system uh, boundaries and transformation uh, areas as well. And we saw those boxes in the transformation selection. And those are the blue boxes surrounding the areas uh, when we grabbed onto a particular transformation. The settings to enable or disable those are right here on the area of use tab in the administrative settings. Uh, and there's actually one level beyond that here, and that's called custom areas of use as well. When we go into custom areas of use, you'll see this is actually going to open up a map interface. And I'm just going to go ahead and full screen this. And on our map interface there, uh, you'll see a couple of uh, red polygons uh, overlaid on the map here. Uh, these are polygons that we ship out of the box. And there's a, a couple that are actually populated. Uh, some of these are, are common areas of use. Uh, around Europe uh, that we were requested to add in there, and others are uh, North American based ones here that we actually provide some filtration based on. So as an example, what I'm going to do here is use my selection tool, and I'm going to click on this polygon surrounding the continental United States. You'll see that highlight, and uh, what we're going to do here is uh, take a look at the filtration that actually takes place within this polygon. You'll see under selected features that I've selected a custom area of use, and it is an unnamed area of use. So we just got a shape there. We haven't assigned a name to that. So I can click on this area of use and edit its properties. And when I do that, we get a little panel that will come up. We can edit the name. Uh, we can assign a priority if we have overlapping areas of use. 
uh, and then we can set up filters that apply to that specific spatial area. Now the filtration dialog looks a lot like all of the other uh, coordinate system dialogs that we've used uh, throughout the, the geodetic parameter database and you'll see all of the different types of objects that we can filter in that area. So I'm just going to take a quick look down under the datum list and I'm going to search out uh, NAD27 in that list. And you'll see there are a large number of transformations uh, that are possible. So if we remember we were talking about uh, the, the 79th transformation a little bit while ago, uh, you'll see that there are actually up into the 80s uh, transformations between NAD27 and WGS84. And also NAD27 and some other datums uh, as well, but a lot of these to WGS84. You'll also notice that under the show column, most of these are actually unchecked. So in the case of the continental United States, there is a national transformation that covers the entire bounding area. And if you are doing datum transformations uh, within that area, and it uh, uses data that is uh, going to the government for any reason, you have to use the NADCON transformation. So out of the box, we've simplified this and narrowed it down to just the highest accuracy transformations that are appropriate for that particular region. Now there are other parts of the world that have these same types of filters. Uh, you'll notice there's a box around Canada that also has a national transformation. Australia and New Zealand also have uh, transformations such as this. And this is the reason there are so few transformations in some of these regions when you actually go back to the main interface and start doing your work. So in our case, we came up with uh, just those, that six uh, short list of ways to get between NAD27 and WGS84. And that all comes from the custom areas of use dialog right here. Now how this relates to Global Mapper is that any filter set up either in the custom areas of use uh, or filters that are just simple on or off filters from the admin settings, those are enabled uh, over in Global Mapper as well. So all of the setup of these is done right here in Calculator, and all of the use of those is throughout Calculator and over in Global Mapper. So to wrap this up, we'll talk just a little bit about uh, how these are actually saved in place. So under the Options menu, once you've taken the time to work through some of the various settings uh, and you want to bring those over to Global Mapper, uh, under the Options menu, we're going to go into the Preferences. And in the Preferences dialog, we have things uh, such as uh, your general settings here, and these are mainly settings that apply to uh, the calculator, things like default coordinate systems and such, but those also apply to any defaults that will be used uh, in the, the portion of Global Mapper that feeds into the GeoCalc dialogs. Um, so when you turn on GeoCalc mode in Global Mapper, you'll see GeoCalc projection as one of the new menus under your configuration menu. The default coordinate system and such will be set right here in the calculator, uh, and those depend on things that come from the file locations. So in Calculator, you're going to be setting up your workspace, as we've been playing around with a little bit here. And in particular, under the file locations, uh, the workspace that's set at the top to always load a particular workspace, that is the setting that is going to point the, uh, both Calculator and Global Mapper to the workspace that contains those settings that you want to share between the application. Uh, it's possible to use multiple workspaces in Calculator, but Global Mapper will automatically grab on to the default workspace that is set in Geographic Calculator. Uh, the data source path as well, uh, the main data source and the custom data source, those are the databases where your definitions are actually stored. Uh, those just need to be uh, set here in the calculator. Uh, typically folks don't need to move those uh, unless you're working on a network installation and you're trying to share one of these between users. Uh, it is possible to set those to network locations, um, but that is taken care of right here. Uh, it comes from the workspace, so once it's uh, saved into the workspace, Global Mapper loads it, it knows where to get that database. Um, and the big thing for folks that are working with uh, custom uh, vertical uh, grid files 
or just simply uh, the, the downloadable geoid files as well is where that data path lives. Uh, the data path is the, the repository for all of those grid files. Uh, it's simplest when setting up those custom vertical datums in Global Mapper uh, to put those grid files in the same directory uh, rather than having to use an explicit path. Uh, so all of those files will get stored together. Uh, it's easiest to reference them all together in that, in that same sense. Uh, so here under the preferences, those are the, the main things to take a look at for enabling geocalc mode. Uh, there are a lot of other preferences in there that are calculator specific that don't have any relation to Global Mapper. Uh, but the two main things here to pay attention to are the workspace path, uh, making sure your default workspace in calculator is the workspace you intend to share settings with over to Global Mapper, uh, and the locations of those data source paths and the data path itself. Okay, so that's about all the time we're going to have for today's topic. Uh, be sure to check out part two in our next session. That's going to be hosted by my colleague David McKittrick on actually using the geocalc mode inside of Global Mapper. Um, so I'd like to thank Taya for joining me today. And thank you, Sam. Okay, and we'll see you next time.